Welcome everybody. So glad you could join us today. My name is Eric Liu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Citizen University and I'm also the executive director of uh, the Aspen Institute's program on citizenship and American identity. And both those organizations were uh, co-hosting uh, this gathering here today. And um, I'm so pleased that all of you could join us and so excited for the conversation that uh, we're about to have with uh, Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett uh, about their new book, uh, The Upswing. Um, I wanted to take uh, just a moment uh, as folks are coming into the uh, webinar uh, to say a word about uh, Citizen University uh, and the work that we're doing. Uh, but before I do that, I actually want to take a, uh, a moment as well to just uh, extend some thanks uh, to the people who've made this uh, uh, session possible. Uh, first and foremost, uh, from our team at CU, uh, Athena Higgins, uh, who is the mastermind uh, pulling all the strings and uh, uh, puppeteering us here as we go and making it all work and has put a lot of time into uh, getting everything ready logistically and otherwise. And uh, uh, she's joined uh, in the background by uh, our teammate Tanem Fotheringill, who will be uh, managing some aspects as well uh, of this session. Um, and others on our team at Citizen University have pitched in. Um, and uh, my colleagues as well at Aspen have helped to spread the word about this and we're grateful. Um, and over um, at team uh, uh, Putnam Garrett, uh, Louise Converse also uh, has been just tremendous in helping to make all the pieces fit together. So we're really grateful to all of them. Um, let me tell you a word just about Citizen University for those of you who are new to us and why it is that we've hosted this, uh, this conversation today. Um, we're a nonprofit organization based in Seattle and working all around the United States uh, to foster a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship in the United States. Uh, we think about that work uh, really emphasizing the idea of culture, uh, of our values, norms, behaviors, habits, uh, patterns of thinking. Uh, and we follow a simple precept, which is that democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. And that that belief cannot be cultivated simply by exhortation and being told to believe harder. Uh, it has to be uh, actually animated within all of us as citizens, as uh, co-owners uh, of this Republicans experiment uh, to take responsibility uh, for it. Uh, and our programs um, are all in one form or another about trying to cultivate that spirit of responsibility to uh, give people the chance to practice power uh, and to develop a sense of civic character. Um, probably our best known program, which we'll talk a little bit about as we go today, uh, is called Civic Saturdays. And these are gatherings that are essentially a civic analog to faith gatherings. Uh, and they are being held all around the country today. Uh, we're training people from all around the country to lead these gatherings in our Civic Saturday Fellowship. Uh, more on that later. Um, and uh, we just want you to uh, know about this work because we are part of an ecosystem uh, of organizations, endeavors, uh, citizen action all across the land right now uh, that in our view, it really does add up to a nascent civic revival. Uh, and that brings me to why we're here today. Um, we are so excited to be in conversation with Bob Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett, authors of this uh, wonderful new book, The Upswing. Um, and I just wanna take a point of personal privilege to say that uh, not only is this book important and uh, this conversation meaningful, but uh, um, this is also um, in, in its own way, uh, the flowering of seeds planted 21 years ago uh, when I was a student uh, of Bob's uh, in a seminar that he was leading on social capital and on how we uh, rekindle bonds of trust uh, and affection uh, in an increasingly fragmented uh, society. Uh, and uh, Shailen, Bob's uh, co-author in this book, uh, also uh, came to be co-author as well uh, initially uh, as a student and a collaborator. And so there's just this wonderful circle of learning, mentorship in all directions, and uh, we're so grateful to be uh, able to spend time together here. And so what we're gonna do here, um, just in terms of the uh, flow of the show, so to speak, um, is uh, in a moment, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Bob and Shailen, uh, and they're going to lead us through a, a short uh, slide deck uh, that lays out the architecture and the essence um, of the claims and the argument that they're making uh, in this book. Um, uh, and then after that, uh, uh, I'll lead uh, a conversation with uh, both of them uh, for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we will leave the final quarter of an hour um, for questions from all of you who have uh, joined us today. And uh, there is a Q&A function uh, here in the Zoom webinar, and someone from our team will be uh, helping to um, uh, filter those and send some of those my way during the Q&A session. 
So um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna steal too much thunder from your PowerPoint presentation, but I do wanna say that um, you know, the subtitle of this book in some ways says it all, uh, how America came together a century ago and how we can do it again. Uh, and as Shailen and I were just chatting uh, before cameras started rolling, um, uh, the upswing that's implied there is both the ways in which um, that sense of fragmentation, but also re restitching uh, of social fabric has happened before and is possible. Uh, but uh, you all chose the wording of the subtitle uh, on purpose, which is how we can do it again, not how we will do it again. Uh, uh, and so a sense of both promise, uh, but also uh, burden uh, put upon us right now to, to be the ones to uh, make an upswing happen. And so um, with that introduction uh, about this work, uh, let me turn it over, Bob, to you and Shailen for an explanation of what this book is about, why now, and uh, um, what it is that leads you to have some hope that we can, in fact, do it again. Well, let me say, first of all, um, Eric, uh, just as you said at the outset, this is really old home week. Um, and uh, it's delight, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, and I, I uh, bask a little bit in the glory that you've uh, now achieved uh, with Citizen University and, um, and Civic Saturdays and so on, which appear actually in our book because uh, it, they're such an important Feature. I'm going to try to, we're going to try, Shailen and I are going to try to um, uh, be quick giving the basic structure of the book so that people understand where we're coming from. And then we're eager to have lots of questions first from you, Eric, and then and then from the, the other uh, part, members of the audience. Um, if we could have the first slide up there, that would be great. Um, it's, there we are. Perfect. Um, so um, I, I, what we're trying to do in this, and I will only say that the the title Eric has already explained, but the, that curve, that funny little inverted U curve on the cover turns out to be the core empirical part of this research. Um, if we have the next slide, I wanna, um, can we have, they're perfect. Um, uh, this is where we're starting. America is in a pickle. That's a technical term. America is, just about everybody in America agrees that at the moment we are incredibly polarized. I'm gonna show in a minute, we are probably more polarized than at any time in American history with the exception of 1860 to 1865, which was of course all of the, um, uh, all of the, the Civil War. And I see a, mem a, a message in, this, in the um, message box that the, the uh, slides are not visible. Uh, I wonder if that's true, um, I'll keep, looking, I'll keep talking about the slides in a second, but for some reason, somebody, okay, some people can see them, great, okay. Um, the first point is the, uh, political polarization is extreme, really about as extreme as it's ever gotten in American history. And that's also true independently, economic inequality is about as bad as it's ever been, at least in the last, oh, 150 years. And independently of that, we are unusually socially isolated now. It's hard to get really firm data. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but we're probably about as socially isolated as in, in certainly in living memory, we've never been socially isolated, as socially isolated, socially isolated as we are now. And we're also unusually self-centered in cultural terms. I'm gonna show you the evidence for those claims. And, but the central question to begin with is how did we get here? How did we get in this unbelievably, um, awful situation. Um, if we have the next slide, I'm going to go through each of the each of those. Let's begin with economic equality. Now these are real, these are based on real hard numbers. This is not a uh, graduate seminar, so I'm not going to go through the, the underlying methodology, but we use each of the curves that I'm going to show you is based on actual hard empirical evidence, verified evidence. In this case, for example, we have measures of the degree, the dis distribution of income separately also, the distribution of wealth, the distribution of opportunity for economic advancement, all that lies behind this curve. And you can see if we start over at the left-hand side of the curve, um, right, perfectly, um, we get um, these data begin in 1913 because that's when the IRS was created. And you can see at that point, um, you can see at that point, we're already awfully low. And if we had data a little bit earlier, it would have been even lower because this is what is historically called the Gilded Age. Huge gap between rich and poor folks. 
But then you see coming in the, in the 19 teens and up to 1920, we begin to become a little less unequal. We're becoming a little more equal during that period. During the roaring 20s, we go down a little bit, but then coming out of the roaring 20s, even before the Great Depression, America is becoming more equal in its distribution of the um, uh, distribution of income, distribution of wealth, distribution of opportunity. And that increasing in, increase in equality um, continues steadily from 1930 up to 19 through the 40s, into the 50s, past World War II, into the 60s, begins to turn a little bit in 1960. We sort of hit, we hit the peak of, of economic equality in uh, around 1960. Uh, of course, we're far from perfect equality. It's not a commune, but compared to where we've been, um, we, uh, where we had been a half century or 60 years earlier, we're amazingly equal. And then it stays up at that fairly high level until about the late 70s, and then it begins to plunge. And it plunges steadily downward. And what that plunge is, you've all heard about this, is the growing degree of economic inequality in America. Um, and, and everybody knows about that. Everybody knows about the second half of this slide. And if the, if the graph actually continued, we, we've showed you data all the way out to 2020, it would be even further down because you know that in the last four or five years, there's been a steady increase, especially after the arrival of Trump, a steady increase in the inequality and therefore decline in equality. So that's the first graph. You can see it looks like an inverted U. Um, let's go to the next slide, which I think is political polarization. And look at this, it's very similar current curve. Beginning in, and here the, the underlying measures are things like bipartisanship in Congress or the, how people feel about members of the other party. In, in one, by the time we get up to the current period, there are even measures of what's called affective um, polarization. That is essentially, would you, what, let, how would you feel if one of your children married somebody from the other party? And that measures not just how you feel about policies, but how ordinary Americans, and we, we will see that ordinary Americans in more, most recent years it's not just a matter of the top, it's ordinary Americans feeling really a member of one tribe, their tribe, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. But let's go back to the beginning. We were also a tribal, politically a tribal society back in the beginning, 18, around 1900. Um, over there at the left-hand side, if somebody there, good, you can see we were pretty um, polarized. I, I said earlier, probably about as polarized as we had ever been except for the Civil War. But then during the 19 teens and especially after 1910, we begin to begin to see a little more cross-party collaboration and, and people from different political parties working together on shared projects. That continues steadily upward through the 20s, uh, through the 30s, through the 40s, up until the 50s, up until, pause just for a second, because it looks like the, the peak of bipartisanship in America, maybe in our whole history, but certainly in the last a uh, couple hundred years was in 1955, 56. And if you think who was president, then that's the period in which Dwight Eisenhower is president. Dwight Eisenhower was, historians agree, probably the least partisan president in American history since George Washington. But then we still stayed for a long time up at that high level of cross-partisan collaboration. But then beginning in um, uh, about 1970, suddenly we begin to become a little more polarized. and. That trend continues uninterruptedly for the next 50 years. As you can see, more and more uh, cross-party hostility, more, less and less cross-party um, cooperation. By some measures, we're actually at about the maximum political polarization you can get because one of the measures here is what fractions of people in Congress vote with the other party. And as you know, in the most recent Congress, only about two or 3% of Republicans vote with Democrats and even smaller number of Democrats vote with the Republicans. That's almost a hundred. That's if you think about what that means, it's, got, it's hard to get any more polarized than that. So we're very, very polarized now. Um, more polarized than we were back in, the, back in the day, but in between there, there was this period of remarkable um, increasing cross-party collaboration and political comedy. Let's have the next slide. Here we're gonna be looking at social cohesion, what I sometimes call in a more, using a more academic term, that is social capital. And it measures things like the degree to which people are involved in community organizations, the degree to which people are um, uh, connected with their, their family and friends and neighbors, um, 
and the degree to which they trust other people, all of those measures lie behind this curve. And you can see again, beginning in about 1890, America was very lacking in cohesion. Shailen may say a, a bit more about that in a second, but the underlying idea was in that period, um, that was just after the great migration, I mean, the, the, the urbanization and movement of people from fields to factories in the, in the last part of the 19th century. And when people move from the fields, whether the fields were in Iowa or in the shtetl or in, in uh, Southern Italy and move to the, the city, you know, move to the Lower East Side of New York, for example, the older ways of connecting the barn raisings and quilting bees didn't cut it in, in, uh, in an urban um, immigrant slum. And therefore there was a period when people were very lacking in social connection. But then again, you can see beginning around 1900, Americans begin to form new connections, both new civic connections, that is new organizations that are being created, but also uh, even in the family structure, people in the, in the earliest part of this period, many Americans actually never got married. They were, they were called spinsters and, and bachelors. Uh, but then following that's exactly that same pattern, more and more people began to have, uh, be, have a family and be con connected with other members of their community and friends, friends and neighbors and so on. That and beginning to trust people more, that growth in social connection, social capital, you can see goes pretty sharply up to 1920. Then again, there's this pause in the 20s, but then coming out of the 30s, a rapid rise, probably the most civic period in American history. Everybody in America was joining organizations. Every family in America was, I mean, all kids in America were getting married. This is when you get up to the 1960s. Of course, this is the baby boom. In that period, just about everybody was getting married, getting married early having kids, uh, joining groups, but then suddenly, silently, mysteriously, in the late 60s, suddenly all of those forms of social connection, including social trust, begin to fall and steadily downhill um, for the next uh, 50 years. And stop, pause for just a second at, at 2000 there. That's when a book called Bowling Alone was published, my own book about the collapse of, of social capital. And, um, uh, we, we, I didn't have any data further than that, but as you can see, we've now gotten new data and that continued, has continued for the last 20 years, even since um, I wrote a Bowling Alone. So this pattern shows the same, it's remarkable, the same inverted U-curve. If we go to the next slide, please, here we're gonna try to measure cultural solidarity. And this is really a measure of the degree to which Americans have felt we're all in this together or not. We're not all in this together. It's every man for himself or every every person for her, him or herself. And again, I wish I could tell you, take time to tell you about how we actually measure this. We have really hard, reliable statistical evidence of the degree to which people are, feel a, a sense of shared solidarity or don't. And, and, and that trend um, begins, as you can see in the 1890s, those, all of those numbers show relatively low social solidarity at the big, at, and, and therefore a, a sense of very much a sense that everybody's in it for himself. Uh, beginning about 1900, however, there begins to be an increase in the sense that maybe we are in this together. And that sense of cultural increasing, uh, increasing cultural togetherness, Eric at the introducing us talked about the importance that citizen university places on culture. And this is a terrific um, example. We have measures here of the degree to which Americans either have or have not shared a culture of community and a sense that we're all in this together. Going quickly over the trends, you can see as you go up um, in, the, in the teens and 20s, uh, increasing sense of solidarity. There's a, this familiar um, pause during the 1920s, but then coming out of the 30s, steadily upward, more and more sense that we are all in this together. Um, we reach a peak up in, the, uh, in 1964, I think, and then suddenly, almost like clockwork, every that this those measures of connection begin to turn down. Steadily, America moving from a sense that we're all in this together to a sense that we're not. That it's every every person for himself, not dog eat dog. But as you get further down there, you get increasing, um, uh, increasing. I would say cultural narcissism and um, and <laughs> symbolized by our. I am the one um, president. I will pause for a second to say, note that Trump comes into the story long after we began moving toward a greater self-centeredness. 
So Trump is not the cause of this. Trump is, a, in a way, the ultimate symptom of this trend, but he's not the cause. That's, we're looking, we're looking at a much bigger, bigger story than just Trump, of course. So let's put all of these um, graphs together. And then the next slide, you'll see they all are, you're gonna be surprised at this, they're all the same graph. You can see there the trends that I've just showed you for economics and politics and social capital and social solidarity, I mean, cultural solidarity. And they're essentially the same graph. You knew that, but I wanted to show you how all these um, uh, graphs fit together. Um, and you, they fit together so long, so much that you can uh, put them all in a single graph. That's the next slide. I'm about to turn it over to Shailin, but I want to just note that we have come to call this graph the I we I curve. And we do that because over at the left hand side, and then again over at the right hand side, during those periods, Americans are um, very um, uh, divided politically, they're very isolated socially, they're very unequal in economic terms. They don't share the idea that everybody ought to have some decent share of the pie. And they're very culturally um, self-centered. But up in, the, up in the middle period, around 1960, that's when you see um, that America is kind of a we society. We're much more likely to be um, uh, connected in, in economic, political, and social and cultural terms. Um, Shannon, why don't you now take over and tell us a little bit about what all this means. I've been doing the, the statistics, but it's actually much more interesting to uh, look at the, uh, to think about what the narrative is behind this graph and the lessons that we might learn from it. So, sure, go back one slide for me for just a moment. You know, I think the, um, there's been a lot said about this downturn over the last half century. There's almost a whole genre of books that we might call the why America is in such a mess genre that look at this decline that, um, you know, as Bob mentioned, each of these different measures, these are all known by the, the, the individual fields, economics, society, culture, um, polarization, um, and, and, and we, we're especially familiar with the downturn. But the story of this book is actually not about looking back to some supposed golden age when we were all united and together. Because as we will talk about in a moment, that was a very imperfect we, first of all. But secondly, um, the, the moment that a trend culminates turns out to be less instructive than the moment that the trend began, especially because this upward trend, this upswing, as we've come to call it, um, came out of a period very similar to the one in which we are living today. So if ever there were a moment, a historical moment, whose lessons we need to learn today, it's the moment when the last time I started to give way to we. And in historical terms, that was the moment when the Gilded Age, this moment that coincided with the Industrial Revolution, gave way to the Progressive Era. Um, and, and that was the moment at the beginning of the 20th century when all of these negative trends started to turn around. So if we want to turn around where we are today, the argument of this book is that we may do well to look to those lessons. So I wanted to just go over a few of the lessons that we draw from that period. So the first, interestingly, is that there was, a, there was an intense moral and cultural shift that happened um, during this time. It's interesting to just briefly note that a lot of people say, oh, if we could just identify which of these, you know, all of these indicators turned at the same time, if we could identify which one turned a little bit earlier than the others, maybe we would know where we should concentrate our focus and our energy today. And a lot of people assume actually that it was the economic indicators that turned first, that we started to fix economic inequality. And as we did that, all of these other things started to turn in a positive direction as well. That actually turns out not to be the case. If there's one thing that's clear from the data, it's that economics is actually a lagging indicator, meaning that the economic inequality began to ameliorate after these other things turned. And it may be, it's difficult to tell from the data, but when you pair the data with the historical record, the picture that emerges is that the variable that actually looks like it began to turn first was culture. And that's interesting, right? Especially for, you know, hard data scientists like Bob, um, for whom, you know, culture is a little bit squishier usually. But it seems clear that in this period, um, there was a real moral awakening. And what that looked like was a shift from the cultural, the, the, um, the 
social Darwinism of the time, the idea that the survival of the fittest applied not just to the natural world, but was a good way to organize society, um, that gave way to something called the social gospel. You had particularly religious leaders coming to the fore saying, wait a minute, we need to question the primary conceptions, the values upon which we are building our society, we have a choice as to what those values are. And if we look into our own religiosity, we see a narrative that's about taking care of our most vulnerable, that's about being together, that's about functioning as a unit, thinking of one another. And that cultural shift really began to change the conversation in America. And the historian Richard Hofstetter points out that this period was characterized not just by finger pointing, you know, saying, oh, these guys need to change or they're the problem. It was moral indignation directed inward. Elites of the period began to see their own complicity in having created this very negative situation that America was in. Um, and so that moral and cultural shift was also being led by very young people. This was a youth driven movement. Um, the vast majority of the progressive agitators of the time were under the age of 30 when they were doing most of their important work. And so to a large extent today, we believe that we need to foment a cultural shift and that it will likely be the post boomer generations that lead that. Um, another lesson from this era is that the progressives really put association the bringing of people together as a central part of their strategy. It was both an end and a means, an end in the sense that this was a very lonely, disconnected time, as Bob mentioned. So people really needed way, new ways to come together. But also they began to understand that that bringing together, that building of bridges, especially across lines of class and across lines of difference, um, not only fought the hyper individualism of the day, but also created vast new stores of social capital that fueled the rest of this upswing for centuries. So face to face ties, creating those relationships were a really important part of this movement. Um, that moral indignation also began to manifest not just as, as, as sort of outrage, but it manifested as citizen engagement. People got out into the laboratories of democracy, as Louis Brandeis called them, their neighborhoods, their tenements, their cities and towns, and started to, to reclaim their individual agency. And they started to come up with solutions to problems that really transcended that gridlocked right-left framework. Um, this was a time the progressive era, it's worth pointing out, was progressive in a very different sense than we use that word today. The Progressive Era with a capital P was a bipartisan coalition that was often so diverse as to be barely coherent. And there were a lot of competing factions within it, but all of these people were united by a galvanizing sense that citizens could make a difference, that citizens could change the course of history. And as we saw in the data, that shift really played out over decades. Um, and, and the important point here also is that Sometimes when we think of the progressive era, we think, oh, Teddy Roosevelt, right? These charismatic leaders who came along. Actually, they were, again, a lagging indicator. It wasn't that Teddy Roosevelt invented the idea of a progressive era and then led Americans to it. On the contrary, Americans themselves built this coalition. And then the charismatic political leaders came in and capitalized upon that momentum and were able to create the bipartisan political coalitions that created some of the national programs that for which this era is famous. But again, those national programs came later. Um, the last point that I would make here is simply that this we that the progressives set in motion was definitely not inclusive enough. We're sort of sitting here lauding these progressives as having sort of saved America and engineered this upswing. Um, but many of them, it's worth pointing out, were racist. Not all of them, but many of them were had a circle of moral concern that was constricted. And a lot of the, um, the systemic racism that we are reckoning with today was sort of put in motion and built into some of these programs and solutions that the progressives put in, in, into motion. And so it's really important to note that the we that we were building toward at this time was highly racialized. Um, and the needs of people of color were largely sacrificed on the altar of progress. And this is a mistake that we definitely can't make again. But we do feel that these lessons, both positive and negative from the progressive era, may give us something of a roadmap 
for how we might begin to see another upswing today. We've done it once before, we can do it again. And if we just wanna to go to the next slide, I'll end uh, with this thought from Teddy Roosevelt. He said, the fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others is that on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. And that is what we believe. That's what we hope that this, this book makes clear is that we've, we've gotten out of a mess very similar to the one that we're in today. We can do it again, but in large measure, it's up to us. Shailen, thank you so much for that uh, synthesis and Bob for the uh, laying out of the, that, that compelling data. And I, I just have to say on the, uh, on the curves that uh, you overlay on top of each other, after nine months of this pandemic, looking at curves that have that shape, but the goal is to flatten them. It's very, very refreshing <laughs> to say, here's a curve, let's boost it, let's make it even higher. Um, and uh, th that, that truly just kind of makes my soul <laughs> loosen Gary, up. Can I, I'm sorry, can I say just one thing? Um, uh, we were we we're trying to make very much to get, uh, in, get onto the questions, but um, there was another chart that Shailen didn't show, and she, she doesn't need to show it now, but I want to say we are not done with telling you what we want to say about race. Yes. Um, we, uh, uh, we, I don't want to say we should do that now, but I hope somebody in the, in the audience, you or somebody else will ask about race because it turns out to be a very interesting and somewhat surprising story. Well, actually that is the very first question I wanted oh. to, pose, to pose to you here. Okay. Uh, great, great minds uh, think alike. Uh, um, although one thing I want to note, um, and, and Bob, you may have noticed in chat, uh, various people saying that bowling alone um, your book from uh, 20 plus years ago um, is canon uh, for, for them as educators, as uh, practitioners and so forth. Um, I also want to uh, draw people's attention to a book that preceded Bowling Alone that Bobby wrote uh, called Making Democracy Work. Uh, because in many ways that is the germ, the seed um, of so much of what we're talking about now. And that book um, looked at compared Northern and central Italy on the one side with Southern Italy. Um, and its thesis, if I may summarize it very briefly, that's very relevant to what the story is that you've just told here in the upswing, um, was that um, Northern Italy was more resilient, more adaptive, more inclusive, more able to weather change uh, than Southern Italy uh, because it had a much thicker web and ecosystem of bonds of trust and affection and associational life uh, and so forth, less, less hierarchical, less extractive uh, and so forth. And, um, and so, again, in terms of great minds think alike, it's just a, it, wonderful to kind of draw people's attention to uh, this multi-decadal foundation that uh, you and others, Bob, have been building for making the case for where we are right now. So this first question of race, I, I wanted to actually pose it in terms of um, that last bullet point that uh, Shailen uh, uh, highlighted in terms of lessons to be drawn from the progressive era, um, because the question about um, the, the notion that the we 100, 120 years ago was not inclusive enough um, and that therefore we today need to be far more inclusive in our conception of we um, in a sense forces the very question and challenge that we're facing right now. Um, uh, and that is, you know, is it possible when we define who is us, who is in that we, is it in fact possible to stitch together a multiracial, multi-faith conception of the we? Is it in fact the case that um, the resistance of so many people, particularly uh, people who identify as white, the very resistance to the expansion that we uh, may be the block that keeps us from uh, returning to um, uh, an upswing. Um, and so th that's, that's one, one part of the question is just about the extent to which, and you allude to it in the book, white resistance uh, is part of why we took our foot off the gas, as you put it, uh, during the age of uh, the long civil rights movement. Um, but it also just in the long arc of what you're describing, um, I often put it this way. We, we are, this is a case of first impression, the United States right now. We are trying for the first time in human history to make a mass multiracial, multi-faith democratic republic. Um, we didn't try to do that 120 years ago. Um, we, we made a much smaller we and we confined the parameters of things. Uh, and so the question for you both as a matter of history and the history of racial justice and social justice, but also today and the resistance, particularly among white people to a bigger we, um, what has to give in order for us to actually swing toward that bigger we that you're describing in terms of race? 
I'm going to let Shailene say in a minute, but if, if, if the, the story actually is much more complicated than most white people think. And mm -hmm. if you want to know in detail what we think, think about it, um, we had a, uh, an op-ed published in the New York Times over the weekend, uh, which lays out our argument in a little more detail. If you want to know even more, you can, you can read the book, of course. But Shailene, why don't you give the short version of, of what we found? Yeah, so let me just, Eric, if it's okay, give a little bit more of the um, deep, flesh out that background story that you were sort of summarizing, which was great, um, because I think it helps under helps people understand the role that this white backlash and white resistance plays in this broader 125 year story. Because of course, the question, you can't talk about an American we without talking about race, right? And you can't talk about this first two thirds of this, the 20th century without talking about race, because this was a period that was characterized by Jim Crow. It was characterized by violent exclusionary measures on the part of white people to keep that we fairly circumscript, circumspect. And so uh, we talk about those inverted U curves, right? The I, we, I curves. Well, if you were to ask yourself, how did trends toward racial equality look over that same period? What did the graphs look like? Oftentimes we think that they looked more like a hockey stick. We think that it looked like um, black Americans and people of color were completely excluded from the we uh, basically for all of the century until we got the lightning bolt changes of the civil rights movement when things began to change for the first time. And to a certain extent, that's a true story, right? Particularly when we look at things like um, the longstanding lack of, of political representation when we look at white supremacy in mainstream media and in culture, when we look at um, the long delayed entry of black Americans into professional schools and jobs and, and things like residential segregation. But interestingly, one of the surprises that Bob and I found as we looked at this century long data, um, not all the measures looked like that. And so the puzzle was, what does that mean? So um, if we could just pull up that slide quickly, I'll just show you what, what this data looks like. This is a summary of black white material equality over the course of the century. So that's on things like life expectancy, high school and college completion, earnings per worker, home ownership, um, infant mortality, voting patterns. And what you see here is actually a too slow but nonetheless significant movement toward equality between the races during the first two thirds of the century. So if you're looking at this graph, you can see 1.0 is at the top, which means that would be full equality. So we certainly have not reached anywhere close to full equality, but the most rapid progress to this actually came before the civil rights movement. And then after the civil rights movement, we see when we would have expected a sort of acceleration or you know some degree of moving toward that 1.0, instead we see what Eric identified as this foot off the gas, this moment when the momentum basically stopped. So that leads to a lot of questions. Uh, one is how did black Americans make that progress toward equality in the midst of Jim Crow and in the midst of an exclusionary period in our history, particularly exclusionary period in our history? And then why did the progress slow right in the moment when we thought that it would accelerate? So the story behind the, the first two thirds of the century is really the great migration. It's that black Americans really stood up and claimed their place within the we, in the American we, it was their faith in American democracy and in the American dream that won them this progress by moving from the exclusionary South to a slightly more hospitable North, they were able to make great strides for themselves and their families. And that's what's reflected largely in this data. Um, and so they were participating in the we, it was a racialized we, but it wasn't an entirely exclusionary we in that sense. And that's an important lesson, I think. Um, the other thing here is that why did we take the foot off the gas? There's a couple of answers, one of which is definitely white backlash. It was, it's not insignificant that the moment that the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Acts passed was that sort of peak of we. We had been building slowly toward a fragile national consensus around widening the we. And that's when we were able to achieve those le that legislation. But what the data clearly shows is that when you look at the surveys, white Americans were all in favor of those things in theory, but when it came to the practice of actually sharing that pie and actually creating that multicultural environment where everybody was part of it, that support began to reverse. And so on many of these measures, again, the, the, the college completion, home ownership, we see today that, that, that black Americans are in a worse position than they were in the civil rights era, which is really where you get, I think,
um, the background for this immense frustration that we are seeing in the Black Lives Matter protests. And so the final lesson here is that when you layer these two curves together, the IWI curve and this foot off the gas phenomenon, it appears that those we decades were, were more fertile soil for moving toward equality than the I decades. When America takes its foot off the gas, it's the same moment that we shift, broadly speaking, from we to I. So a self-centered, again, culturally self-centered, culturally narcissistic society that's focused on competition is not a fertile environment for achieving racial equality, which is why this broader shift back toward we may be a really important part of, of, of achieving finally um, the promise of a multicultural, truly inclusive American we. Getting there's not gonna be easy, as you said. This is something, Eric, that has not yet been achieved on the face of the earth, a truly multicultural mass, multicultural democracy. It's gonna be hard work, but we know that some of those, that recommitment to the very concept of we has to come in order for us to be able to get there. Sheila, thank you for, for that um, uh, additional explanation. And um, uh, I would point people to the book itself, Upswing um, for, as Bob said, not only more detail, um, on this part of the narrative. And uh, as you all explain in the book, you focus in the narrative on uh, African-Americans, Black Americans, for whom there is a long record of data, um, whereas for uh, Asian-Americans, uh, you know, Hispanic, Latinos, others, there's, there's less. But uh, um, I, I think there is a, uh, uh, and, and you do as well in a closing uh, chapter near the end of the book, uh, um, a similar analysis on gender uh, and the I, we, I curve, which, um, uh, I saw that uh, a question came up on that, and maybe when we, in a few minutes, uh, go to some of the questions uh, that have already been submitted here, we'll, we'll return to that. But um, one other thing that I wanted to put to both of you, Bob and Shaylin, um, <clears throat> you know, it's of course music to our ears at, at Citizen University, your emphasis on culture, and, and in some ways, the, the point that you make that uh, the first lesson that you drew from the progressive era um, was that, in a sense, culture preceded structure that cultural shifts, shifts in norms, values, attitudes, mindsets, habits, um, preceded and helped create the frame of the possible um, then for structural reform in law, legislation, and, and policy. Um, and you describe that cultural shift as a moral shift. Um, and, uh, and you described it in, in, in terms of not only a, a move away from hyper-individualism and, and narcissism, but a, a sense of greater responsibility. Uh, one of the most interesting graphs you have uh, in the book, which maps that same curve, is the um, relational use of um, rights talk versus responsibility talk, um, and how uh, Im imbalanced we are, again, today, uh, in focusing only on rights for me rather than responsibilities toward uh, the we. Um, what, in your view, um, looking both at that long history and also today, um, what does it take, actually, to catalyze a culture shift? Um, you emphasize that it's not about charismatic leaders. Um, how in a bottom-up way do you see from the progressive era um, people forming either old or new clubs or associations to recatalyze a sense of culture change and responsibility taking? Um, and is it as possible today uh, in a society that is uh, less religious uh, in a traditional sense than we were 120 years ago? Um, culture question. Well. Um, Shailen, why don't I start and, and then you jump right in. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus, Eric, mostly on, you know, what, what we would do now, not just the earlier period, but everything, everything I'm going to say draws directly on that earlier period. The, the, the thing that is stunning, actually, I think, when we found it is in how much detail today, today, right now, 2020, is just like that earlier Gilded Age nadir, and, and therefore a lot of our lessons, I think, really apply right now. So let's talk about that in particular now. Um, first thing, keep in mind, what we found when we look back at the history is the action is with young people. I mean, people my age can comment, comment on this and did then, but the people who did the action were young people. That applies in there are a number, many reasons why that's true, but it's partly because young people are coming anew to the world. And they're, they're, they, they can see opportunities and, and 
constraints, but also opportunities that are not so visible to those of us who already formed our minds in an earlier era. Um, religion was an important part of that, and Shailen's already alluded to this. Um, the role that the um, social uh, gospel played in that earlier period, the social gospel narrowly defined was, uh, was associated with evangelical Protestantism, but the fact was much more generally American religions of all sorts, I mean, including the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church at that point um, was going through exactly the same kind of transformation from focusing only on power and hierarchy to focusing on you know, what, what the gospel says, uh, which is um, the gospel is about helping the least of us, not uh, the least of them. It, it, was a, it was about how difficult, it, the gospel is about how difficult it is for the rich to get through the, uh, to get into heaven through the eye of the needle. It's the, the and, and it is not an accident. I think it's really important today. We talk about today, what, one of the things that gives me hope is Pope Francis because Pope Francis once again is speaking morally to a large, well, he's speaking, of course, to people all around the world, but he's speaking especially to American and, and, and Catholics elsewhere in the world, saying, calling attention exactly to those parts of the passage that, that uh, Francis, Francis of Assisi called. So religion is really important, and I think it could be important now. Um, the last thing I want to say is there are practices in which people can learn through doing, not just through lecturing, you made this point earlier, but not just through lecturing, but can learn this sense of moral obligation. I think myself that national service programs and other kinds of youth service activities, like the Peace Corps, but I'm, I don't mean just the Peace Corps, I mean that whole array of activities, um, is, is in principle that kind of action and actually should be now. And now I would be, I'm speaking actually to the Biden administration, by all means, get to work on expanding youth service programs. And it has the added virtue that actually that today, even in America today, there are large, that's a largely bipartisan idea. That is, there are lots of Republicans as well as Democrats who support national service programs. So I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm rambling, but I'm trying to convey a sense in which this issue of culture needn't be mushy. It wasn't mushy then. And, and the last thing I should say, because we always say it when we're talking about this point is, um, uh, Civic Saturdays, is that I got the right name, Civic Saturdays? Yep. Um, we, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, that is forms of moral commitment and citizenship that in some sense echo re traditional religion, but also speak to people who are no longer themselves religious. Well, and I will just add um, before going to another question here that our vision for Civic Saturdays is that it can speak to people who have perhaps left traditional religion, but it can also speak just as clearly to those who, who live very uh, full faith lives. But yep. the idea is that what we're talking about is what you might conceive of as civic religion or what right. John Dewey called democratic faith, that the yes, same exactly right. uh, acts and rituals and invitations of meaning making and fellowship um, that one might find in a godly religion are necessary to kindle and earn uh, the faith necessary to sustain self-government uh, um, in, in a civic arena. Um, Shailen, I know you had more to say on that culture question, um, if you wanted to add a point briefly, because I want to then um, pivot to synthesizing some of the very rich uh, uh, questions that have come in um, from, um, from our audience. Well, I love just invoking a couple of the voices from the progressive era, and you just did, right? It's no coincidence that you just name, name dropped, you know, John Dewey, one of the, <laughs> the leading thinkers of this period, and one of my favorite, my, my dog is actually named Dewey, I named it. <laughs> After John Dewey, progressive, nerds, you progressive know. era nerd, I really am. But um, but you know, the other one is Jane Addams, one of my one of the heroines of the progressive era, and this is what she said. She said, "We are under a moral obligation in choosing our experiences, because our experiences ultimately determine our understanding of life. We have to choose in a polarized world to put ourselves experientially." into contact with people who are not like ourselves. The more that we can do that, the more we will see the mindset change. That is what you saw in the progressive era. Jane Addams is herself an example of someone who had no idea how the other half lived, again, to use a phrase from this era, until she put herself in the position to do so, and it completely altered her view of the American project. So we've got to get young people particularly, but all of us, out of our echo chambers and into experiences that change our understanding of the we.
So uh, thank you so much for that. And, and one of the things that I'll say about, um, uh, about that notion, you know, Brian Stevenson describes it as proximity. It is a choice to be proximate uh, mm -hmm. to not only the challenges we see in society, but to people who might live and think and believe differently from us. Um, I, I wanna now synthesize some of the questions that have come in uh, here and piled up. And, and there are several questions, which if I may kind of paraphrase them, um, boil down to a thing which we have not named as explicitly here today, but is very central to our work in our teachings at Citizen University, and that is power. Uh, you have questions about to what extent is this about the, the rise and fall of unions and organizing? To what extent is this about the ability of people to push for a more equitable uh, redistributive tax policy? And to what extent is this about the uh, ability of um, uh, people on the margins, whether that's people of color uh, or women, uh, to actually claim voice and power? Um, and so I'd just love for you to s say a word about the extent to which, um, is there a threshold uh, point at which power becomes so concentrated and hoarded in the hands of a few that it becomes challenging or impossible to actually push the society back to a we part of the curve, that, uh, that, that you have a few hoarders who are going to um, you know, disempower so many. Um, uh, you know, many of the folks in both questions and comments note that you know, whether you're talking about uh, a Sanders movement or a Trump movement, that uh, uh, people will find a way and find an outlet the way that water will find a, 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 an outlet and find a way. Uh, but I'm curious whether your lessons from the progressive era and the Gilded Age warn us about uh, a dangerous threshold point at which people actually start checking out and giving up. And, and if so, are, are we, um, you know, in that kind of uh, dangerous zone of powerlessness? Well, I'm sure both of us want to respond. Let me say just a word. I've been following a lot of the questions in the chat line and in the Q&A. And I, one thing I need to say is a lot of the topics that people have asked about are actually covered in detail in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a book of, you know, 300, more than 300 pages, and we're trying to compress it into, you know, into 10 minutes or 20 minutes of presentation here. So there is a long discussion of unions, for example. There's a long discussion of tax law. There's a there's a discussion of, of there's a long discussion of gender and and uh, and the role of women. There's a whole chapter on that subject. There's a long discussion of um, I don't know if I said this income tax. Um, there's a long discussion of uh, immigration. Um, so there, are, I'm not trying to escape the questions. I'm only saying, given the li the limits, yeah. many of the things that people are asking quite reasonably about are actually covered in the book at some length, and many of those things are about power. Um, we, the, I think the other thing I want to say, then, then Shailen, jump in to make points you want to make. Um, in a way, the most, what we think of as the most important lesson of this whole experience is that we are not condemned by history. We're not condemned by structures, even. We're certainly not condemned by laws. That is, there's we have agency, individual people have agency. If you look at the history, and I mean look in detail at the history, um, people were making choices. And fortunately, the folk, fortunately for us, the inheritors of that first progressive era, at least some of the people, the people that we highlight in this as members of the progressive movement of that time, they made choices that changed the direction of history. And I, I don't know how, quite how to emphasize that enough, but what we're most worried about among, we're not basically worried about young people today. We're actually quite hopeful about young people today, but, but, the, but the concern we had was that we wanted young people to know by looking at this earlier, the real facts of this earlier period, that they're not condemned. They don't have to be cynical. That's that, what worries me most about young people is that there are some young people today who are sort of cynical. We can't do anything about this. A power lead is in charge or, or history is this way or you know, the high tech industry is ruling everything or whatever. There were all of those, there were high, there were monopolies then. There was a sense that, that you couldn't change things then. And if those folks had surrendered to that, to that drift, just drift along, along with history, we wouldn't have had the outcome we do. But they instead had a more, not just activist, but a more self, um, self-confident um, a, a, a sense that if we act together, we can change the direction of history. And that's what we would like to convey to young people 
today. I'm, I tend to get carried away. Shailen, what else would you add to that? To that the response? only thing, the only thing that I would just add is 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 exactly to just emphasize the point of how similar this period was. When I actually looked into the history of the Gilded Age, it, it took my breath away how similar the experience of it was to today. There were so many commentators decrying plutocracy, which is that, you know, the the um, marrying of money and power and how that seemed completely intractable. And people saying that democracy had gone off the rails and that we they were decrying that the American experiment had failed. How familiar is that to us today? They felt the same thing. They felt a dizzying complexity driven by technological change that they just felt like people couldn't get their feet on the ground, which is what we feel today, right? They felt that that, that everything was moving so fast that, that it was just out of our control. And it, even in the midst of that, people came back to center and said, the center of this is citizenship. The center of this is the, the, the faith in the democracy, my ability as a democratic citizen to influence. And one person and 10 person and 100 people started to believe that. And that is what made the change. It's hard to believe, we wanna believe that there are all these forces behind our con beyond our control because then that sort of gives us an out, right? But actually the reclaiming of that agency is the core of this story. History will is, go in the direction we choose. And it is a bottom-up story, largely. And I want to I want to try to lead against the idea that some of this was, you know, going to happen naturally. It wasn't, and it didn't come from the top down. It was largely from the bottom up, mm -hmm. rupturing patterns, previous patterns of power. If, if I may just jump in on one last point slash question here in, in, in our final minutes, um, that point about it being bottom-up. Um, and and Shailen, your last uh, observation there, um, implicit in it is that it's about human scale interaction, yeah. right? Uh, which means the more local you go, the more rooted in place uh, you are, the more likely you will be to uh, rekindle this culture of responsibility taking rather than shirking um, and a shared uh, common purpose. Um, and so uh, again, a thread of questions that have come through here um, is about the nationalization of our politics and our, our civic life, and particularly the way that technology and social media today enable that nationalized politics to create very bifurcated bubbles of fact and narrative, um, such that uh, the, the more national you go, the easier it is to just live in, a, in a, an imaginary world where there aren't people who don't think like you, right? Uh, th that is harder to sustain the more local you are because you still got to deal right. with people down the street. And um, I'm wondering if uh, just, uh, Shailen, we were talking before we uh, rolled just about the dangers, uh, you know, of technology and the, the kind of what President Obama has called the, you know, the epistemological crisis uh, mm -hmm. of people having their own filter bubbles and not knowing uh, what, uh, what facts are uh, or what people, uh, other people see. Um, how do we build a we through that technological context right now? Well, this is going to sound overly simple, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. The best way to fight disinformation is relationship. We can regulate Facebook and that needs to happen. And Facebook needs to regulate itself. And we need as citizens to call for that. But if I want to know what's really happening in America, I need to be in conversation with other Americans, particularly those that are right outside my doorstep. And we forget that, right? I think it's such a simple thing. And we forget that actually that, that it, is, it is relationship that can remind us of what we have in common. And so, um, you know, I think we, we have developed a habit of looking for ambitious national programs. We just need somebody to lay out a program for how this is all gonna change. And then we just need to set about getting everybody on the same page for implementing it. Bob and I do not believe that that's going to work as a starting point. Uh, we believe that ambition na national programs will need to come, but they are going to come from the bottom up, meaning that people have to start right where they are. They've got to start right where they are. And that doesn't even necessarily mean something as complicated as joining the school board, which seems daunting to people. That means going next door to your neighbor and starting a conversation and building a relationship. That's um, actually yeah, how it happened before. And that's how it's going to happen again. Uh, let, let me, Bob, I'll give you a final word here, but let me just, uh, by, by way of partial closure, say that uh, an invitation, um, all of our work at Citizen University is about essentially curating and creating uh, invitation after invitation for people to form that kind of relationship. Uh, find a Civic Saturday near you, 
if you're interested in learning how to lead Civic Saturdays and create these gatherings, um, go to our website, uh, citizenuniversity.us slash apply. Uh, we, are, we have a cycle open right now for our Civic Saturday Fellowship where we train people to lead these gatherings and build these trust-based, relationship-based communities. Um, and we would love for more of you to join us in that. And Bob, um, we're at time, but I wanted to um, uh, give you the final word here on, uh, obviously you, you, you said you, you get carried away here with excitement and that, uh, that hopefulness is infectious. Um, and what uh, you, you spoke, uh, spoke a lot about and to young people, uh, for those of us who are a little bit older, um, what do you want uh, someone like me, a Gen Xer, uh, to do both in relation to our elders and to people younger than us to stitch this together in an intergenerational way? Um, Eric, if we'd had more time, I would have actually wanted to say a lot more about uh, the internet and social media because I think that's an important uh, issue. But the message there, and I will try to, I've got to speak in, in the soundbite here. Um, if we had more time to talk about the internet, I would say exactly the same thing I did earlier about the larger problem. And that is, we can make of the internet what we want it to make. If we want the internet to be, um, if, we, if we choose to watch cats all the time, we're gonna get one kind of internet. But if we choose to use the internet to connect with neighbors about changing problems in our neighborhood, it will become that kind of neighborhood, not, not just magically, but because that's what the entrepreneurs will provide. We, they're responding to us in part. Of course, we're responding to them too, but I think we should not think agency, agency, agency is the key point here, Eric. We can change things if we want to. Bob, thank you so much. Uh, I, I can't think of a better note to end on that idea of we have that power. Um, Bob Putnam, Shailen Romney Garrett are authors of The Upswing. Um, and I encourage you all to get this book, to read this book uh, and to put this book into practice because ultimately um, it's our job and our responsibility. Uh, and the question of whether we can do it and whether we will do it uh, is in, in our hands. Um, uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Shailen. Uh, thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, we have recorded this today and uh, Citizen University will send out a, a link to the webinar later um, where you can find out more information uh, and dig deeper into the book. Uh, Bob, Shailen, thank you. Uh, and everybody, I think we're going to just close the webinar out and have a great uh, rest of the week um, and holiday season. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.